<laughs> okay, well, we're live. Welcome to Whiskey Whistle. I am here in the Whiskey Whistle studio. Uh, well, at least virtually with uh, my very good friend, Patrick Van Zuidam. And you're going to have to help me pronounce that more properly. Uh, uh, eventually, Patrick, Patrick will do. <laughs> but uh, anyway, welcome, everybody. I'm really happy that you're here. And this is going to be a really exciting event to talk about, about Millstone Whiskey. And not only the whiskey, but also talk about the whiskey maker, uh, talk about the distillery, and to talk about uh, everything that goes into getting this to where it's going to go into your cabinet and then finally into your glass to enjoy it as I'm listening to myself. Uh, there we go. All right. So first of all, again, my name is Mark Kaufman. Welcome to Whiskey Whistle. And Patrick, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about you. Now, your official title is Managing Director and Whiskey uh, and Distiller, I believe, Master Dis uh, Distiller. Master, so, yeah, yeah. Do you, yes. So please tell us about yourself and um, a little bit about your personal history, and then we'll talk about uh, the uh, uh, distillery as well. Yeah. Nervous. Um, nervous. <laughs> ah, don't be. <laughs> um, well, I grew up uh, in a distillery, of course. My father started the distillery in 1975. And then, um, you know, my parents were poor uh, because they had their own distillery. Having a distillery and being poor is pretty much the same thing. Um, so as I grew up in the distillery, um, my parents were working seven days a week. So you think child labor is something that happens in China, but we are very good at this. Well, no, we had fun. And I, um, you know, my brother and me grew up in the distillery. We did our first distillations as when we were just children. And, wow. um, you know, my father had a, what we called the big still that my father had was 500 liters. The still you see behind me is 17,000 liters. So, you know, there's been a great progress in the distillery over the years. And yeah, it's just a really good, f fun place to grow up. You know, it's funny you say I, I actually spent a lot of my childhood as well working in the family business, starting from, you know, age seven, eight, nine, stocking shelves. It was a grocery store. And then by 11, I was bagging groceries. And uh, I think um, uh, by the time I was 14 or 15, I, I could have run that that grocery store by myself with all of the different things I had learned. And you uh, are and not sure. a, you're not worse off because of it, are you? You you know, it's it's a way to grow up and you know it, it also teaches you values and um I think that's important. It's something I try to install in my children as well. I think it's important that they learn that, you know, if you want something, you have to work for it. Mm, exactly. Now we have a few people who have popped in. So let's uh, just say a quick hello to all these great millstone fans that are watching along. We have frequency dead who has poured himself some Millstone 2013 peated American Oak Moscatel. And we have uh, mm. Freddie Van Terbeek, who is joining. And uh, welcome to Freddie. We have Gear uh, Akers, who's joined from uh, from Barcelona. And uh, well, anyway, that's a great start. We have about uh, 13 other people that haven't, uh, either they haven't found the chat yet, or they're just uh, watching quietly and sipping their Millstone, wondering uh, what we're going to be talking about today. So... Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Yes, please share what you're uh, sipping, whether that's Millstone. And maybe you, you may not have any Millstone yet. So just share whatever you are enjoying. And we have uh, Yarka Winters, who's joined. Welcome to the show. And Scott Bailey hey, Yarka. Who is... Yes, Yarka. Hi. And we have uh, a friend of mine who's here local in Winnipeg, Scott Bailey. And he is a, uh, well... He's now a collector of Millstone, so uh, pretty amazing stuff. And uh, we have Whiskey Ace as well, who's joined. So anyway, welcome, everybody. Now, uh, that was a, a very brief little uh, a bit of history about, about you, Patrick. Now, I know that, um, uh, that there is uh, probably, I don't know, is it hard to separate the, the whiskey and distillery and, of course, the Jennifer life uh, from your personal one? Have or have they kind of melded? What together? is that? <laughs> <laughs> what is it? What is that? A personal life? <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's. I think it's pretty much the same way for me as it was for my parents. Um, I think running a distillery is pretty much a full time job, and it it just it runs into every aspect of of your life. I think um, 
you know, um, I actually, my son is here tonight to do tech support for me because, uh, you know, normally the, the distillery doesn't have Wi-Fi. So I chartered him to run me a Wi-Fi <laughs> into the <laughs> distillery, you know, it's things perfect. like that. It, it's, it all meshes together. And, you know, I don't see that as a bad thing. You know, I think um, we are in a wonderful business. There's lots of wonderful people in this business. And I think that's the wonderful part that you all the time, you're meeting new people, talking about things that you love to do. And, you know, that's never a bad thing. Yes, absolutely. Now, um, do you have just the one son? No, I have um, a 17-year-old girl, a 14-year-old son, and a 5-year-old son. Wow, that's so, that's quite the spread. A whole and collection I think, of them. Yes, a very good collection. Uh, I, I think that we're probably somewhere in the, in the vicinity of a, a similar age. I'm 46, and my kids are 9, 7, and 5. I'm uh, way so older than you, yeah? Get out of here. <laughs> Uh, I turned 50 last year. No way. Yeah. That's that's amazing. And you have a very young 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 kid and I think that's uh you know when I go to pick up my kids at school and I look at everybody and they're all in their 20s or their early 30s and I'm thinking to myself, oh, okay, they're all looking at me and wondering, you know, what happened and uh, why I'm why I'm so old picking up my kids from from school but you know whatever. That this is the new this is the new uh, the new world, I think. Uh, anyway, so well, let's get into a little bit of whiskey. We're going to be tasting uh, through this this interesting range here, and I'll tell that in a minute. So we'll have a whiskey. We'll talk about it, and then we'll get into some other things, and we'll field some questions uh, from you as well if you're watching along. Um, so if you have a question, uh, please uh, please just tag me so that I can see that that you have a question. So at whiskey whistle. Then it pops up in red, and I can see it very clearly. And and then I'll I'll just pose that question to uh, to Patrick uh, for you, and we'll talk about that in a minute. All right. So the lineup today, we have quite an interesting selection here, and uh, I I am I'm I'm blessed. And uh, there's just it's just so amazing. In fact, I'll have to go get one more bottle that I want to show towards the end because I, I I ended up after trying all these, I ended up falling in love with your whiskey and your craft. And uh, <laughs> so when I when I heard that there was a bottle of, of 23 year old Oloroso um, Millstone available at a shop, well, I just had to uh, to get it and, uh, and it arrived. Oh no, I'll, I haven't opened it yet. I'll probably save that for Christmas or something like that. We'll see. All right, so today we'll be trying the Millstone 1996 American Oak. And this one is uh, specially selected and bottled for Canada. I seem to not be focusing very well here. Come on, camera. Yes. Anyway, yes, so one that... of those things that uh, I got into a huge argument with my family over, mainly my brother. Over this yeah. whiskey? Yeah, well, it's a long story. You have a minute? Oh, yes. <laughs> we have lots of minutes. <laughs> um, Greg and Yarka were visiting. And you know they are great people. Um, so we always have lots of fun. And this time they were coming around and they wanted to do something exclusive for Canada. I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll draw some samples. I needed to draw some samples for my own bottlings as well. So I draw a table full of samples and maybe, you know, 40 cask samples on the table. And then we individually went through the samples as you do, you know, just a table full of glasses and, um, and for devoted whiskey people. And there was one glass that everybody marked right away as the best glass on the table. And that was the bottling that you just held. Um, wow. And of course, I got into a trouble with my brother because he said, oh, this is such a wonderful cask. I, wanted, I want to have it for my domestic market. I said, well, too bad. I promised uh, Greg and Yarka first pick. So there you have it. You know, it, it went to Canada. You know, Amazing. I don't even have, I, I have a little bit of, you know, left over. Yeah. I don't even have a decent bottle of it. <laughs> well, that's that's a really interesting story. And uh, one thing I, I, I'll just show you, uh, we won't talk about this one yet, but um, this is another one of the very amazing whiskeys that uh, that I have. And you can just see the difference in, um, in how I've been uh, progressing through the bottle. And uh, this is certainly, for me, this is uh, about 
probably 99% exactly what I like in, in a whiskey that's matured in American oak. And, I, you know, you'll have to tell me, I, I just can't understand that, uh, that this is virgin oak, but let's, let's get into that anyway. So, um, this, this was distilled in Mark, 1996. We, yeah. yeah, we have, you have to imagine, Mark, we tasted them blind. Yes, we had a table for our glasses. We tasted them blind. To be honest, it wasn't immediately clear to any of us that it was an American oak, virgin oak cask. Because, you know, um, it was one of those casks that got lost in a, in a corner of the warehouse. Mm. Yeah, normally, I would not leave a, a virgin American oak uh, whiskey in a cask for that long. It's just, you know, one of those things that happens. You put it somewhere, you, you don't use it straight away. You know, I, I was probably originally intended for my 10-year-old American oak. And then as it progresses, you, you would think that it would go overpower the whiskey, the whole Amer virgin oak thing. It would get too much vanilla and too much toffee and too much coconut or cloves or cinnamon. But as I know this whiskey, it's actually quite balanced for, for and especially if you keep in mind that it's a virgin oak cask. It doesn't, you know, it's quite a balanced whiskey. Oh, extremely. And I think that's the first thing that popped out uh, when I when I tried that. The first sip was, this is, this has to be like ex bourbon or something. How can this be virgin oak and have rested in a cask for, 20 years and, and nine months or however long it was. Um, so just, just really impressive. Um, and when I'm smelling this, at, at the very first, um, it's got just so much going on there. And uh, there is, I, you know, I can't even begin to describe all the things I'm smelling here. But one thing that is coming out that is really interesting is something kind of like a rum cake. So uh, there's a cake that that you make that's uh, actually has some rum uh, rum included. So it's an actual an, an alcoholic cake. So a rum cake. So I'm getting this this wonderful rum cake, and um, and then as I taste it, I guess we should do that. Uh, cheers to you, Patrick, and thanks to everybody who's watching along. Uh, Proust, how do I say cheers in 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 in, uh, in Dutch? Well, usually we say cheers, but um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think probably in Dutch is prost. 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 Hmm. But even in the mouth, it's, it, it's very well balanced whiskey, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's so, um, then in the aftertaste, you get that typical thing that you often get from American oak, virgin oak cask is that coconut, you know, kind of. Yes. Kind of, uh, Coconut. Very much in the aftertaste there. And um, some, some I want to say some stone fruit, a uh, little mm. bit of something like mango. So it's got a real, real tropical mango, edge to it. Peach, something mm -hmm. like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but 51.45%, and it is uh, it's sippable rate at cask strength. In fact, I think only once I've, I've tried that with water. I like it with water, but I like it just right out of the bottle. So um, I, I don't know. How do you typically um, enjoy your whiskeys? Not when you're blending, but when you're enjoying the finished product, how do you yourself, Master Distiller Patrick Van Zuidem, how do you handle your tasting? I'm not a big fan of adding water to it because that sometimes, mm. you know, that, that can really damage the balance in the whiskey. Um, I think if it needed water, we would have put it in here at the distillery so we can do it in a controlled and, and balanced way. I think if we bottle something at cask strength like this one, I think we bottle it that way because we you can drink it that way. Hmm. You know, if it was too harsh or too alcoholic, um, we wouldn't bottle it at cask strength at, at all. So I think this is just a whiskey that you can sip like this. doesn't need anything, I think, um, time. Mm -hmm. A good friend, Fine. and maybe uh, like a log fire or something. And speaking of time, so I poured that at about uh, 11, 11.45 or thereabouts, just to make sure it had enough time. And speaking of time, I should pour this Oloroso so that it's ready when we're going to get to that one. 
And I'm going to hold that up so everybody can ogle at this beautiful decanter. Uh, what, what was the deciding factor in choosing this beautiful decanter for your, your deluxe bottles? So the, we are a family distillery, yeah? So it's owned by my, my parents, my brother and me. So that means that all these decisions, um, we argue about them as a family. <laughs> so we don't need outsiders to argue about these things. We can do that all in the family. That, that's, that's amazing. Um, now, are those, are those locally produced, the, the, the bottles? No, or? no, it's, no? Uh, it's produced in France. In France, yeah. Wonderful. All right, so I've got the Oloroso Sherry 1996 ready and waiting, but we're going to try my new make, uh, pardon me, my new world whiskey of the year 2021 uh, in a few minutes. I'll get that poured now, and then there's a few things I'd like to, to ask you before we uh, uh, carry on to uh, the next whiskey. But um, one thing I'd like to say about that American oak, um, I've had... I've had a virgin oak from, from companies like Stranahan's in USA, in Colorado, who bottle their virgin oak at, at four years old. And it comes out as a very Coca-Cola-esque kind of a flavor right out of, uh, out of the bottle. Um, and so when, when, uh, when, when, when Greg and Yarka told me that, no, this is, this is virgin oak, I was just taken aback. I thought, I don't know how. After that many years, it can be just so elegant and balanced, and uh, uh, it's got all kinds of uniqueness. And I think, I think if people try something like this, um, I think a lot of the so-called sherry bomb uh, lovers might actually shift their their purchasing a little bit towards uh, towards something like this if they could get it. So that's that's how much I like that one. And I, if it's okay with you, Patrick, I'm going to give this mm -hmm. uh, a malt hug and a malt kiss. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Oh yes. Well done. Okay. Kind of a silly thing that I like to do. Uh, all right. So now just back into some interesting things so that everybody can uh, can learn a little bit about about the uh, the company. Could you just walk us through very briefly? With the uh, the history of uh, of your distillery and how to pronounce it in your native tongue. <laughs> um, yeah, the distillery was founded in 1975 by my father, um, and it was, of course, a very difficult time to start a distillery in the 70s. Um, but my father is kind of stubborn. Um, I'm not like him at all that way. Um, don't tell my wife that I said that because she don't have to laugh. Um, no, no, my father was a, a great distiller and um, he started his own distillery after working 25 years for one of the big distilleries. And then, you know, we kind of became our thing. We grew into it and um, slowly um, it, it grew into what it is now. It is a distillery where we, we like to do everything in-house. Yeah, you, you talked about the bottle before. So right. the, the label design, the bottle design. Um, we grow our own grain here just in town. Amazing. Um, yeah, it's, it's all done in-house. And, and I think that's something that we do differently than most of our colleagues. So just to interrupt you for one second, is, is the grain for your whiskey all done from that uh, that family farm, it, it it is not a family farm, but yeah, it's a piece ah. of land that we uh, have, and, and 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 some other lands that we lease, um, yeah. where we grow this grain, um, and then um, yeah, it is all done here in in town because I think it's important. There eh? was a whole discussion, as you know, there's a whole discussion in our in our branch in our industry about terroir or not terroir yes. or you know does it exist or does it not exist um, for the anglophones here he said terroir <laughs> yes and it's a wonderful thing discussion of course to have um and i think terroir is something that that does exist and is really important to whiskey and i think that is why we feel it's so important to grow our own grain yes because yeah. it it is makes the whiskey truly know of the land and from the land it's 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 from here 
it's not made anywhere else. I, I think that is uh, personally that's the epitome of, uh, of of a distillery. I think every distillery wishes they could do that, and even the even the the big massive distilleries, uh, they they may say that uh, there is no terroir, but secretly they know that there is, and I think more and more. Um, there's there's almost just no question anymore uh, about terroir. Well, so yourself, I think that needs to be celebrated more that this is also uh, Dutch grain that's being used. That's really impressive uh, because so many so many new new world whiskey distilleries, whether they're in in Taiwan or in India or in um, uh, in, in Canada as well, uh, some of the new uh, single malt distilleries here. They're using their 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 malt. Their malt is coming from from Scotland or from uh, from other foreign sources. So they're they're actually negating that uh, that step of completing the, the the terroir story. So I think I think that's really impressive uh, that um, that that you do that and that that's really important to you. Uh, uh, just very quickly, a quick shout out to everybody that's joined here. We have. Uh, another Winnipeg Whiskey Club member, Joseph, uh, Joe Gulino is here. Hey, Joe. And a good friend of mine, Richie Z. Welcome, Richie. And uh, we have GWiz99J who's joined in. He's asking uh, his question to you, which I'll, I'll mention. He's asking where you're located in, um, uh, or say, pardon me. He, he asked, were you always at the current location in Barl Nassau? Yes, actually, we are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, um, my father started the distillery, you know, um, right behind me. We had he started with 300 square meters. Um, right now, we have about four and a half thousand square meters of distillery. So um, it's it's grown a bit, but we we started from that humble beginnings. And every time we had a little bit of money, we built a new building. So um, yeah, it's kind of uh, expanded from there. Yeah, that's great. And there is another question is, which big distillery did your father work for? My father used to work for the Kuiper. I think you know the Kuiper in, in Canada as well. Yeah. Yes. They, yeah. Used to, they used to actually have a distillery in Canada as well. I don't know if they yes. still do, but they used to have Impressive. a distillery. Yeah. Um, they do a lot of... That was, um, actually, that was actually the reason. Sorry. Oh, no, no. Go ahead. That was actually the reason that he started his own distillery because he was supposed to go to Canada to, oh. to run the distillery there. And then they didn't need him there anymore or uh, they didn't want to let him go. So and what you're telling was... me is that there's a chance that you could have been working at a distillery in Canada right now. Could have been, and yeah. I could be with you right now, but instead, yeah, well, but for me, actually, for me, it's, it's actually better because I have a, a destination that I can, I can take my family to at some point And, uh, We'll we'll come and uh, uh, hang out and maybe um, I think I think my five year old might might like to meet your five year old. He's more than welcome. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> my five year old actually likes to help in the distillery in the mornings before he goes to school. Amazing. So, you know, um, my wife works here as well. So on her okay. way to drop him at school, he comes to the distillery early and helps Daddy in the distillery. Um, That's amazing. He loves that. That's so sweet. Oh. Wonderful. Teach him young. Exactly, exactly. All right, so uh, we're going to get on to the uh, Oloroso, uh, pardon me, Oloroso Sherry, 46% ABV, and I'll just show the bottle. The other one, yeah. So uh, I think, uh, Patrick, maybe you saw, uh, maybe you didn't see, but maybe you did see that I picked that as the New World yes, Whiskey thank you. of the Year for, uh, for, this, for 2021. And, yes, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Oh, my, my pleasure. And, you know, uh, it wasn't my first time trying this one. I actually had a, a mini bottle of, of this whiskey uh, about a year and a half ago. And I put it in a lineup with seven other little mini bottles from, uh, from other distilleries. And this was the outright winner of the night. It, it beat out, um, uh, which one now? Uh, what's the new distillery that um, the, uh, the, uh, Glen Allocky, pardon me, it beat out Glen Allocky cask strength. That's not uh, that the new. Ten year old, <laughs> and and a whole host of others as well. And uh, so at that moment, I thought to myself, "Wow, this is this is impressive that 
we have something so world beating coming out of uh, out of a, a well relatively young distillery and it's quite a young it's quite a young say, whiskey as well mm -hmm, right this is four years old right yeah so, yeah some of it is four years old yeah yeah, yeah this one was this uh, the dist distillation date is may of 14 and the bottling date is uh january oh so actually this is three years and uh nine months yeah, it's quite oh. a young whiskey sometimes, and it's and it's uh, it still works even at that young age. It still works. I think that's one of the maybe uh, we can talk about that later when we taste a new make. But yeah, I think mm -hmm. um, it's something that that we try to do, and and it's very critical to us that you make a very nice new make, and and as that new make ages, you get a, a that kind of layers and complexity added to the new make. In, in in the barrel hmm. yeah but um uh, this one also i popped i popped the cork and i i had a sip and it blew me away and at that moment i packed a sample and i sent it to uh my club uh second like the the vice president james who might be here but he's got his kid at home today um and i didn't tell him what it was i sent it to him uh just unmarked and i said you got to try this and tell me what you think. And uh, later that night, when he tried it, he he called me and he said, "What is this? This is incredible! Oh my god!" And I said, uh, "The first thing, first thing I said was, this is three years and nine months old." And he was just blown away. He just could not fathom that something this young uh, could be this amazing. What do you think the reason is that this can do so well at that young age? I, mean, it's, I think it's part of the production process, uh, Mark. I um, don't know how geeky I can get, but mm. um, turn up the geek factor. I think, yeah, I think if you compare our, our production process with what my friends in Scotland do, I think you know overall it's pretty much the same thing that everybody does. Yeah, everybody uh, uh, measures the grain at the same temperature. I think it's it's when you start draining the warts, the, the sugary water that comes from the mash, um, that's where the difference is. Oh, please start. explain. So, yeah, because um, in Scotland, most distilleries use a cloudy warts. So the, they drain the sugar water from the grain. Yeah, so the, the mash tun has a false bottom with little holes or little slits in it. The idea is that the, the grain stays on top of the, the, the false bottom. Yeah. And yeah. warts said uh, the sugary water drains through. Now that sugary water then ah. gets pumped straight into the fermenter or the washback or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you had, of course, you can imagine that in the beginning when the wort starts to drain out, you also get a little bit of uh, protein, little pieces of grain coming with the warts into the underback. And it's that... Mm -hmm. That adds the cloudiness, which is great for the yeast because you just love that cloudy warts. But um, to get a really clean fermentation, to get a really clean flavor, we like to recirculate the warts over the grain bed. So mm. it takes a little extra time, about 20 minutes per, per rinse. And while we recirculate uh, over the grain bed, all those um, extra fatty acids and things get stuck on the grain bed. So the grain bed acts as a filter and you end up with a crystal clear wort. Actually, it looks pretty much the same color as the whiskey will end up. That's impressive. That's really impressive. And so I, think, yeah. I, think, I think people may not uh, be fully aware. So um, when, when you're cooking the grains, you have, you have the husk and you have yes. the crack, cracked grain and it's all there um, uh, steeping. Brewing. Yes. That's the actually that's the brewing process. Yes, that's a uh, mashing, so, brewing. That's mm -hmm. the yeah. And uh, and then so what he's talking about is so all of those husks are like little pieces of fiber, and they rest on the bottom of uh, of that um, uh, that um, false bottom. Uh, yes, and and they act as a as a bit of a filter uh, to to catch other uh, solids that uh, that are in that that liquid. So, so basically, you just run it through a second time, which uh, helps to clear out the the yes. the, uh, the wart, and yes. um, 
So now you mentioned that the yeast so like that. that. So you're doing something that you, the yeast doesn't like. So then how do you compensate? We don't. Um, mm. You know, let me stress first that there's no good way or bad way of doing this. Yeah, It's not mm. that a cloudy wart is bad and a clear wart is good or the other way around. It's, it's just that a cloudy wart gives you a different flavor profile than a clear wart. Mm. So it's not good and bad. It's just a different flavor profile. Um, the yeast loves that cloudy wort and uh, as a as such starts fermenting really quickly and really fast um, and also gives a lot of stress to the yeast. So you get more higher alcohols formed. That's the things that gives you that grainy flavor in the new make. So that really fatty grainy stuff mm. that uh, is in the new make. That is higher alcohols hmm. and the question is not good or bad it's a question of how much of that higher alcohol do you want in your beer so i like my beer very fruity i like a fruity beer so i want not too much of those higher alcohols in my beer while fermenting and when you're talking about higher alcohols you're not talking about uh about uh, ethanol you're talking about other types of ols alls Yes, you, you, you're usually, um, yeah, there's a lot of butanol, uh, isopropanol, those kinds of things that are formed in any any fermentation. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of how many, how much is formed and how are the balances between the different higher alcohols. That will determine the end flavor of the whiskey. Mm -hmm. so, All right, now we have a, a, a very geeky question coming ah, uh, that, that is great. And that's from uh, Gear Ackers. He asks, "What's the ratio of husk, grits, and flour when you're grinding your 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 when you're milling your grains?" That's a very good question. I have no clue because I never check. <laughs> All right, I think I think uh, you know there, there's, I think every distillery ends up sort of uh, finding the what they think is the sweet spot, and yeah, yeah so never you have touch to test the it. Setting on the mill. <laughs> Never touch the setting on the mill. Nobody wants that, uh, Mark. I'll, but, I'll make uh, sure that I don't. When I visit, I will not touch the setting on the mill. No, but it's, uh, what Geert means is, is uh, you can put the rollers closer together. You end up with more fine grits. And if mm. you space them a little bit further apart, you end up with more coarse grits and more husks. Um, and the thing is that the coarser it is, the quicker it will drain. So the will drain um so um you have to find your balance in in the distillery with your mash tun and your mill and and you have to balance those two that it works out uh okay now we have another question from freddie which we'll talk about when we get into the peated whiskeys okay freddie so uh about the source of of peat so we'll talk about that as we get into uh our last couple of uh, of whiskeys just because that that makes sense to talk about it while we're enjoying the the peated whiskeys, uh, so anyway, this is just a beautiful whiskey. Now, um, uh, you know, personally, I have a very wide palette uh, of things that I enjoy, and I uh, I'm not I'm not sulfur sensitive, not too much. I do have a limit. I found my limit uh, in a bottle of Cavalan Solist Sherry, which uh, I I've had a couple of bottles of that. And I bought one in, when I was in Korea about a year ago, and it was a nine-year-old um, uh, Cavalin, which is very old for them. But uh, it was it was just just a little bit above my comfort zone for uh, uh, for sulfur. Now um, I think when you are um, when you're doing it craft and you, when you're using, I, I believe you have worm tubs, yes. No, actually, we have shell and tube. We have shell and tube. Stuff. Okay, so shell and tubes will actually reduce the the outcome of of uh, of sulfur uh, in a yes, sense. Yes, you get a you get a cleaner new make. Mm -hmm. um, so then I wonder. I guess it's the sherry casks that um, introduce some amount of yeah. sulfur. I think the sherry casks um, introduce, um, like some wine casks do, a more noticeable, maybe this more disagreeable. Uh, sulfur note and um, I think the sulfur notes that come from the mash itself are probably we don't feel that as too objective or too objectionable I think yeah. it's that sulfur notes that from the 
cask sometimes. You know, I think it can actually add something, a little bit of sulfur, you know, it can add something if it's just the right touch. A hundred percent. Absolutely, it can. And, and it and is it is something that is uh, attractive. It's it's like... It's like a person who who is, um, um, you know, there's just some people that that exude uh, a wonderful natural their 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 smell. I mean, I, it sounds a little weird what I'm talking about, but but uh, anyways, so it's just like this natural, uh, wonderful particular scent that um, uh, a bot like there's just this uh, interesting uh, bouquet. I guess it's a ni nice way to put it. That is, um, it's it's almost like you are, you're enjoying um, some 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 chocolate and uh, um, all kinds of dark fruits, and and then there's also like uh, uh, like an oil lamp. There's an oil lamp burning in the room, and so you have this this sort of mix of of uh, of scents that's. Just making it all sound and smell just incredible. I, I think I can't I can't verbalize it well enough. No, no, but I think I think people will get the gist of it. I think a, t a touch of sulfur is 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 no not a bad thing. It's it's just a, you have to balance it out between everything, and like you said, you have to balance it out between all the other flavor components, and it has to be a harmonious uh, whole. Absolutely. All right, so that's really wonderful. Um, so this Millstone Oloroso Sherry, um, I hope that you can find that wherever you are. Uh, if you're in Canada, this can be found in Alberta, I believe also maybe in, in British Columbia. Um, so look for that one. It's about $80 in, uh, in Canada. And uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you saw my point the other day about this when I said, okay, this is $80 versus um, McAllen 12 year old that is now $130 in in Canada and uh, I just I will not buy another I, I would buy this nine 99 times out of a hundred I will get this one over that McAllen 12. Well thanks for that that's a big compliment um, I have to say I am a, I'm quite a McAllen fan myself I, I love McAllen's um, I think they're they're one they make wonderful whiskey uh, I still have to go and visit their new distilling temple. Have you yes. have you been there? I haven't. Uh, I haven't been to Scotland yet. Uh, I hope to. The only distilleries that I've visited visited have been in uh, Winnipeg here locally, and also in uh, in Japan. Oh, so good. I'll get I'll get over there, and I'll make sure that I have a few days to come and spend some time in uh, the Netherlands as well. It's over an hour and a half flight from Scotland, so it is not Perfect. that far. All right. Now, um, of course, I've I've ruined our timeline that I wrote out for this. We're probably way off in time, but that's okay. <laughs> that's probably my fault. <laughs> no, no, I, probably mine. I probably mine. I think I think maybe um, uh, probably the the two of us together is almost a perfect storm in terms of uh, making things uh, uh, changed as far as your expected timeline. But let's get let's carry on here a little bit. Um, we will, uh, we're going to start trying the Oloroso Sherry 1996, which is, uh, again, just a mind-bogglingly amazing whiskey. And as we sip, sip and talk about that whiskey, uh, then uh, we've already talked a little bit about the grain and the yeast and the fermentation. Uh, so then we'll get into talking a little bit about, um, about your, your particular sort of distillation techniques. Of course, maybe those are secrets. So don't share things that you don't want uh, anybody else to copy. But um, anyway, so this is the one we're going to be trying. And I hope that, uh, Patrick, that you still have some of this one for yourself uh, over there. I do, there. actually. I do actually. They have some in the glass here. Great. So that's uh, Oloroso Sherry 1996. This is special number nine, it's called. And I don't know what the turnout of uh, this was. It looks like 300 bottles Uh of course, probably you had a number of similar releases from different casks uh, that uh, that might have might have ended up in different markets. Excuse me. Now, so this for was the people a small that are book. watching this one, yep. No, this was a, quite a small. I think this was a single cask uh, bottling. Single cask. Yep. Okay, so this one was distilled in uh, October twenty fifth, nineteen ninety six. 
and it was uh, bottled in, um, uh, let's see, September 2nd of 2016. So we are uh, about a month shy from being 20 years old, <laughs> which Don't get when, me I, when, I see this, <laughs> when I see when I see this, I'm thinking there's a reason why it was bottled before it was 20 years old, because then you no. could put a fancy 20 on there. Uh, no, my brother almost killed me over it. Um, <laughs> I just, you know, this, this, this fitted into my production schedule. So I, I bottled it, um, at this age and my brother got into a fit and, um, <laughs> <laughs> said, now I cannot put 20 on the label. I said, who cares? You know, it doesn't make the whiskey any less good. Right. Yeah. But I guess, I guess he knows, he knows there's a certain marketing, uh, plus, from seeing that uh, that 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 twenty uh, on the bottle, um, maybe so maybe too funny. I, but then on the other hand, Mark, I think people that try this, um, once they open the bottle, I, I don't think they care whether it says nineteen years on the bottle or twenty. Absolutely uh, not. I Absolutely at the, not. At the end of the day, it's about the whiskey and and how it tastes. And I think this is actually pretty decent whiskey. And I'll put That's this an understatement. Right. That's the understatement of the year. <laughs> I think I'll put this up against any um, McKellen um, that is out there. Um, absolutely, I, you know, one hundred percent. Absolutely, uh, this is. I mean, eighteen-year-old McKellen doesn't even come close. Rare, rare cask, maybe. I haven't had anything beyond. Like I, I haven't had uh, 21 or 25 year old McCallans, so I can't quite say. But um, uh, if we're talking about um, if we're talking about McCallan 18, McCallan 18 does not even hold a candle to to this one. So I'm just going to pull this lid off, and you can see how wonderful and dark this color is. In fact, I have a little white background over here so people can see that. Um, this is, uh, it's, it's like the color of, of root beer. It is supremely dark. That This is real mahogany. Mm. When you talk about mahogany color for whiskey, this is one of those. And uh, you don't get too many whiskeys that are, that are as dark as that naturally. So pretty, pretty amazing. And we have uh, uh, Zara who's joined. So welcome. And I'm going to pop this lid and give it a quick whiff. Just massive wall of, of fresh, delicious raisins and plums and uh, uh, I don't know. Do, do you do you know what vina tarta is? No. What is that? Uh, it's a Scandinavian cake uh, made with um, uh, like layers of of uh, of a uh, a light cake, and then in between each layer there is a layer of um, uh, of prune. So it's like cake prune, cake prune, cake prune. Oh, you're making me hungry. Up, 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 about 10 layers. And then on the top, they put a nice, nice little layer of uh, marzipan. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. I you can have to that. try that. You, you bring any? I'll bring some. I'll get, oh. my, I'll get my mother <laughs> to make some and then I'll bring it with me. Um, I think it's probably not many people are aware, but uh, uh, I'm... Uh, uh, I'm I'm of Danish heritage. My father was born in Denmark, moved to Canada at age seven. So half of my tasting notes are things that are come from Denmark. Uh, my mother is from Ukraine and Poland, so there's a lot of uh, uh, flavors that I associate with things from from um, uh, Slavic Europe, and and then living in in Korea for 13 years and, and living in a Korean family. A lot of my tasting notes come from things from there as well. So anyway, yeah, so what... Vina Tarta, I'll bring you some. And Joseph knows. He says Mark loves marzipan. Yes, yes, I do. Yes, so do I, actually. <laughs> and uh, we will talk about what Gear just mentioned. He talks about um, Solera barrels versus sherry season casks. But let's have a quick... Uh, little cheers and then we'll try that one together and talk about these amazing cheers. barrels cheers mm. 
I can't even I can't even understand what's happening in this glass. When I when it's I quite when I come from the the forty six percent, the younger one, with mm. its um, uh, elegantly woven in delicate sulfur notes alongside all the dry fruits, and it's more and, fruity that one. Eh? The the young one is more fruity. Yes. This one's got more marzipan going on and all kinds of things like that. Mm -hmm. Chocolate. More, more layers and more complexity. And almost an absence of, of sulfur 100% here with this one. Yeah, with single cask, you cannot have any sulfur because it will, um, it will be very difficult to balance out because uh, you have nothing to blend it against. Mm. But yeah, we, um, we use... Old but cherry, there's cherry syrup in here. Amazing. Patrick, okay, carry, carry on. Don't let me stop you from, from talking about this. <laughs> no, so um, I think this is a, a prime example, and so is the, the younger one, of a whiskey aged in uh, what we call production casks or solera casks, which means that these sherry casks have actually held sherry uh, that ends up in bottles. Yeah, so these casks have held sherry um, for decades, maybe generations sometimes. Yeah? Some of these casks are 70, 80 years old. Mm -hmm. So they've been in a, in a, in a bodega uh, for generations before it ends up in my warehouse and I fill it with new make. And so in our industry, we separate two different types of sherry casks. We have, on the one hand, um, the seasoned casks, but, but the all the major distilleries are using because they are um, very uniform in the type of whiskey that they give. They don't give any sulfur, so they're very predictable, these seasoned casks. Mm. And then on the other hand, you have these crappy old casks that we use that have held uh, sherry for generations, um, and they give you not a completely predictable uh, outcome because some have a little bit of sherry, some will have a little bit of ethyl acetate, some will come from the top of the solera, so they will have held young sherry on average, some will come from the bottom of the solera, and they'll have held old sherry. And all these things influence, of course, the outcome of the final whiskey. So there's no good barrels and bad barrels. Um, these casks are all wonderful, whether they are seasoned or solera casks, but on the other hand, if you smell this whiskey, this is not something you can produce or reproduce using a seasoned cask. This is a very typical um, whiskey that comes from one of these old crappy Solera casks. Um, you know, sometimes they are very delicate. Um, you know, a new cask, when it, you know, bounces on the floor or something, they usually bounce up and nothing but you know, when you drop a cask like this, it is just disintegrates because Smashed. the wood. Oh, yeah. Over the <laughs> years, the wood tends to be get a bit delicate, and 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 um, yeah. So you have to treat them with respect, and you have to um, you have to care for them, and they are more prone to leaking and all kinds of things that we distillers don't like. But then again, on the other hand, they do produce this kind of whiskey that you are now smelling, and you. You know, you cannot do this with a seasoned cask. No. And, and, and it's, not, it's not that seasoned casks do not produce wonderful whiskies because you only have to do taste and nose any of the major Scotch whiskey distilleries to see that they make wonderful, wonderful whiskies with these seasoned casks. It's just that this is different. It's not better. It's just different. Of course, I think it's better. Otherwise, I wouldn't make I it. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's mind. I just can't even say it's mind boggling how great this is. And, uh, the the nose has sense of um, uh, like a, a very black walnut, so dark walnut, and um, uh, something kind of uh, I don't know, almost a little bit like um, like truffle oil. So truffle and, oil, and I, walnut. Yeah. yeah, the peel of the walnut. Yeah, the, the outer skin of the walnut. Yeah. yeah. And something like marzipani thingy, yeah, some almost um, almond-like uh, yes, flavors. Yes, very, very the, marzipan. Um, just in the in the background, a little bit. 
when you were a kid, did you ever get um, a pigs in the shape of, of uh, sorry, marzipan made in the shape of a pig? Yes. So I, I love I, I love those. Yeah, I love all marzipans, but yeah. <laughs> we have some similar tastes. I could eat That's a whole great. pig. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Marzipan. See, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, when, when people talk about um, rancio, Yes. Uh, which which in, in whiskey is uh, harder to pick up until you really get into old whiskey. Uh, of course, there's there's different levels of rancio. If you get into co uh, cognac, um, there's a lot of different levels of rancio they talk about. Um, this one, I believe, is the, the very last level of rancio where you have this, uh, this really – Smooth, interesting, walnut, uh, nutty, uh, interesting fruits and dark fruits all woven together. But uh, what are your thoughts on on this this term and what this means here uh, think, for this whiskey? Uh, Rancho is a, is, a, is a thing that you get in some of these old whiskies. The thing is that you don't get it in all of them. It's, it's something that happens in some casks. You get it, you know, you have 10 casks, all the same, all filled on the same day. And 20 years later, you open them, three have Rancio. And, and you know, seven don't have any sign of Rancio. So why does it happen in some cask and why doesn't it happen in other cask? And I think that is one thing in our, in our business. One thing that makes it also interesting is that the honest truth is that we don't know. Some <laughs> things we do not know. And, of course, as a control freak, for me, that's hard to admit <laughs> but it's it's true. It's it's some things happen in casks, and you open a cask, um, and you don't know why the whiskey came out exactly like that. Of course, we have an idea. We we put something in a cask, and and you have a vision where you want this whiskey to go, but you you're not sure until you open the cask ten years later or twenty years later. Only then do you realize what finally happened in that cask as you know, it's the whiskey, because it's, it's mm -hmm. something that is sometimes truly intangible. Now, uh, there's a really great, great question from Greg Winters, uh, the, uh, the, the Canadian Im importer for, uh, Hi, Greg. for, and Yarka Winters, the importers for uh, Millstone in Canada through uh, Craftwork Spirits. And he asks about a microorganism that was present um, in, in, in some casks and he can't recall what it was, and he thinks that it was in this cask. A microorganism in the cask. Mm, I don't. I don't know. Usually, the casks, you know, when you fill them with uh, with whiskey, all the microorganisms in them they die straight away. Um, what you get sometimes with the sherry cask, of course, is uh, um, that. If they don't sulfur the cask before they send it over, sometimes the sherry in the in the wood of the cask um, oxidizes a little bit uh, before um, we get the chance to fill it, and then you should rinse the cask because you get get a little bit of ethyl acetate formed in the cask right then. So mm. you have to rinse the cask out before you fill it. Ah, um. uh, okay. So it looks like um, maybe Gear has the answer here. He's talking about about floor. The, uh, ah. uh, the 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 upper layer of certain certain sherries, where you get um, yes, but that's well, th that that's for um, uh, that's for for non oxidized sherries. Right. So then right. we're talking about fino and manzanilla sherries, uh, where yeah. you have this layer of wild yeast that is floating on top of the sherry. Um, but at this were oloroso casks, and oloroso is. Um, oxidized is an oxidized sherry and yep. therefore uh, no floor uh, floats on top that is the difference between fino and uh, oloroso is is that layer of floor uh, that which is a basically a wild yeast that exists in the casks but you you don't get that in oloroso uh, casks okay well interesting now uh, just a quick uh, hello to all the people that have been joining in since the last uh, time i mentioned uh, so we have a Christian Strecker, who's also uh, a Winnipeg Whiskey Club member. He is actually studying distilling, Patrick, 
uh, in Ontario at the um, uh, the Niagara on the Lake School. I, I forget the name of the school, Christian, but uh, anyway, he's uh, he's really really gung ho, and I think um, hopefully he will find himself um, uh, employed at a, an interesting place such as yours someday. Um, and he's on Instagram. Uh, you can you can check him out at Winnipeg Whiskey Lover. So that's Christian Strecker. Uh, we have Scotch Down Under who's joined. Welcome, Scotch Down Under. I know we've talked a little bit in the last couple of days, so great to see you. Uh, Welsh Toro, who's been following Whiskey Whistle for quite a number of years, has popped in. I'm so glad that you're here. We have uh, Christine Daisy, who is in Oregon, and uh, uh, I sent her a glass and a few other things. I'm going to send her some more things very soon because I forgot to send her a link for a tasting the other day, which is very, very bad of me. Um, Tisk tisk. Uh, anyway, so we, oh yes, Niagara College is the name of that. We have Wine Light Media who has uh, popped in and uh, Greg, Win Greg Winters I've mentioned already. Peter Burns and Darcy Wood from Craft Cellars is a, a great online and offline shop in Alberta, Canada that Winnipeg Whiskey Club uh, often sources uh, uh, bottles from and uh, really glad that they're here watching along. This is an incredible e event here for lunchtime in Canada, I think, uh, interestingly, for, for you over in uh, in the Netherlands, this time is a little bit better for people to, to join in on a Friday night. But um, anyway, great stuff. Uh, all right. So that was the Olorosa Sherry 1996. Uh, very impressive and very much, very much a contender for uh, like amazing top top 20 year old whiskey we'll call it 20 years old even though it's a few months <laughs> one month shy um top 20 year old compared to things like uh uh like glendronic or mccallan or uh glenallachy uh all of these really really famous uh sherry bombs that people uh people talk about and i think if uh, uh if this is something that sounds interesting to you uh i don't know if there's many of these left but i know that that that's a, a a potential reoccurring bottle. That if you if you find a cask that uh, that you that you have that's in the distillery waiting, that maybe eventually you'll put out another fancy Oloroso sherry like this one someday. Let's hope so. Let's hope. All right. So now we're going to get into the peated side of uh, of your whiskeys and. Uh, before we do that, we have another question from, from Yorka. Uh, please ask Patrick about the Paolo Cortado casks. <laughs> You're not getting any. Uh-oh. <laughs> can, I, can I get one? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to start with um, some Millstone New Make. This is heavily peated Millstone New Make. I have a little sample. Um, and and uh, thanks to the provider who will go unnamed. Well, you're the provider, Patrick. Thank you very much. <laughs> this one's 46%, I believe. Uh, let's see. New make. Yep. No, Does 60. Say the strength. 60. 60. 60. So fruity. This actually... Um... The first new make distilled in the stills. And so this is the first run of those stills. This is really super fruity. So and the peat you know is... You... Uh, the the peat's there, but it's it's taking a back seat. And we have... Uh, we have maybe like plums and... Um, a little bit of uh, lychee. So really interesting, um, kind of um, musky fruit, and also uh, this kind of um, stone fruit like plums. What uh, what's the I PPM think for this, this is one? A, a very good. I think it's distilled from no, I know it's distilled from fifty ppm uh, malt. Yeah. And actually, the, the malt really for this comes from Scotland. Oh, I see. I see. Is and that this from is Port Allen malt? 
I tried to buy there, but they didn't want to sell to me. Oh, Diageo is hoarding that. Huh. That's not nice. Well, now oh, this yeah, is my stand kid new make um, that I've tried. So yeah, I think this is. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Pardon I think me. This is We've a got a good little bit example. of a time gap here. Yeah, I think this is a good example of uh, our distillery style. I think if you taste this, you can see. Because this basically is straight from the still. And even at 60%, it is not harsh. It's elegant. It's mm -mm. fruity. It's mellow. It's, you know, it's very typical for what we do here. It's not... You know, it's, it, you wouldn't think it is a new make straight from the still. It is, you wouldn't think it was 60%. No, not at all. It is quite elegant, actually, for a new make. So this comes from our, you know, we, we have a clear warts again. Okay? Clear warts. And then we do a long temperature controlled fermentation on this. So this is the uh, fermented for seven days at a low temperature. So we do a long, slow fermentation, which is very important to get all those fruity flavors formed in that in that beer, basically, yeah? because the beer is what we distill into this new make. So you get this all these fruity flavors uh, formed from this low, slow, long, slow fermentation. And then, of course, because it's such a long fermentation, you get also lactic acid bacteria playing along in this uh, concert together with the yeast. So they get you get an interaction between the yeast and the lactic acid bacteria. And then you get wonderful in your beer. And then when you sip it, you get this wonderful um, fruity flavors that go through. And you again this is 50 ppm malt so it's heavily peated malt that's what we call in the business heavy peated malt but again it's not that smoky as you would expect it's not as smoky at least as maybe you would expect from the 50 ppm malt it's actually quite what an I elegant uh, kind of smokiness to it it really is when i first smell the glass the, the 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 smoke and the peat is is kind of hiding and it's really fruity at first, and then when you when you take a couple of sips and you've actually introduced some of uh, of your saliva into the whiskey, which there's just no two ways about that. That's what happens unless you're doing a a, a Ralphie Mitchell style of sip like this. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but so anyway, a little bit of a little bit of my saliva must have gotten in there, and then all of a sudden uh, the um, it opens uh, up. The, the nice uh, hardwood smoke started coming through. And the palate is, uh, it, again, you said it, it is, it doesn't, doesn't seem like 60% at all. And it doesn't seem like it is super heavily peated, which it is. Um, and you hold it in your mouth and you get these, these bursts like pow, pow, pow of pepper coming out, which is just so impressive. And I think, I think there's two ways in which this can be this this you know it's not whiskey this is new make it's it's a spirit drink or whatever you end up calling it um there's two ways that this can be very popular this can be popular just simply for people who are interested in peat and want to try it unaged and see how it is this is just so impressive secondly there's people like me that uh that that buy a little little mini casks and this one's uh, I, I I I tore it apart you for the it. staves. <laughs> I broke it. I wanted to I wanted to to char some uh, uh, some staves and and see what happened with uh, with that. But uh, anyway, so people people like me that buy these little mini casks that might want to try uh, just just their own aging process. Maybe they want to put in some some local local wine. Like here we have uh, we have a Haskap. Uh, Haskap wine that's made locally, so I could try, uh, you know, seasoning the cask with that, and then put in the the uh, the peated new make and make my own amazing, interesting, 
I couldn't call it millstone, but I could call it, uh, uh, you know, I could call it awesome. <laughs> So that's two ways. I think that's two. Well, two I think this is a, ways people can suck could buy it. I usually use it as like a, an educational tool to to mm. show people what we do here at the distillery, because you can you can maybe hide some of your flaws in the new make in a good cask or in long aging or whatever. Mm. But this is pure. This is straight from the still. So you cannot ha hide anything in this. This is how it is. And I think. If you look at how this is balanced, how this is put together, how we, you know, distilled this, um, because after that long cold fermentation, we also take uh, um, a whole day, nine hours to to do just distill it in the wash still. Just a really long, slow fermentation and a long, slow distillation as well. So both the the, the wash distillation and spirit distillation. We, we take our time. And I think that's where you get these wonderful balanced fruity flavors in, in the new make. It's so impressive. And I, I said it in chat and I'll say it verbally as well. Um, as soon as, as soon as that's available in a shop, I'll be buying a bottle or a couple bottles of, uh, of this new make, because um, as you said, it is uh, there's, there's no smoke and mirrors here. It is showing exactly how you've made it and uh, showing all of its flawless beauty, I think. Because most distilleries will not show you their new make. They will not have you taste a new make because, you know, let's be honest, most new makes are not that nice to drink. Hmm. Um, and you need a good cask and a good long time to, to balance things out. But I think, you know, if this is all there is. It is this um very clean and and open so this is what we are and this is what we do and i was i was planning on trying that last night just to to give myself something to talk about but um i ended up falling asleep early and uh and not even not even trying it so i'm trying this for the first time here uh together with you in this live stream and i think everybody could see my reaction plain as day I mean, super impressive, Patrick. Well done. I think I think uh, I think you are at the, uh, the the front edge. You're at the front edge of um, uh, of elegant craft distilling at its finest in the world. Um, when uh, I think I think everybody's had the experience where they're so excited to try some new distilleries, uh, new whiskey or product. And they buy it and they take it home and uh, they pour it and then they sit there and they sip it and they end up thinking something is not right here. And it's happened to me a number of times and I try not to worry too much about it because these are young distilleries starting out and I'm, I'm happy to at least have supported them by buying a bottle of, of their, their, their whiskey. Um, but uh, there, there's no, there's no pity buys here at all. With uh, with Millstone, you're, I'm buying it because it's it's awesome, and it is as good or better than anything coming out from anywhere in the world. Which I think uh, there's a, there's a fellow that joined here earlier today. I I don't know if he's still here, Scott Bailey, but um, he he's wondering if maybe uh, maybe your your whiskeys someday we'll end up like uh, Karuzawa out of Japan and sell for I hope not because they closed that thousands down. of dollars. <laughs> oh no 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 right. No no not 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 the not the fate of the distillery but but uh, the whiskey going going for bonkers prices at auction. I hope not. Because actually the, the the problem is with that really expensive whiskey that it doesn't get drunk by people that deserve to drink it. You know, mm. I want to make whiskey for everybody. I want to make whiskey that people drink. I don't want to pick, you know, $500 or $1,000 whiskeys that sit on the shelf somewhere because people want to show off to their friends and never open the freaking bottle. You know, if you buy it to enjoy with your friends, perfect. I don't care. But don't buy it just to sit in a basement or sit in a shelf. Whiskey is for drinking. Whiskey is for enjoying. 
We're not going to solve, you know, the, the world's problems. We're not going to, um, you know, cure Corona with it. We're not going to cure <laughs> world hunger. This is for enjoyment and people should enjoy it. And this is what, what making whiskey is all about. You know, you, me, some friends talking about it, enjoying it, you know, and you got some wonderful whiskeys out there and none of, and they don't have to be that expensive. Um, I was at some friends in the UK and we, we had all kinds of whiskey on the table, you know, 20 year old Yamazaki, you know, wonderful whiskeys on the table. And, and he's from South Africa and he brought a bottle of bait. It's the silt from corn. It's from South Africa. It's wonderful. Wow. You know, it's a 17 uh, pound bottle. It's, 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 you know, it's not expensive whatsoever, but it is the whiskey that we all took a second glass of. It is, you know, it doesn't have to be expensive to be great. It just have to be great to be great. Yes. Yes. Now, uh, Patrick, I want to give you the floor for one second. And I'm going to go get the special bottle that that I bought so that everybody can have a look at that. And uh, I'm, I'm, I might, I was going to save it for Christmas, but based on hearing what you just said, and based on the mood that we've created here, uh, I just might, I just might open it and, uh, and let people at least get a get an inkling as to what it's like. So I'm going to give you the floor for one second, and then I'll be right back in about uh, uh, 15 to 20 seconds. Here we go. So talk about whatever you want. Can I talk about the next whiskey? I can. I'm going to talk about I'll be right back. one of my favorites. Uh, one of the whiskeys that I want to talk about is this Peated Amarona cask. Because I actually don't like um, red wine cask. I, I actually... And I really think they, they, they red wine cask gives you a, a balanced whiskey. But in this case, um, a friend of mine here in the Netherlands uh, said, you have to try that because you know, I had some whiskey from Amarona casks and it was wonderful. So you know, basically he forced me into it. And I'm, I, this is just one of the best things I ever made. This is the Pieter Amarona. It's a whiskey that is just four years old, but it's got this wonderful flavor profile. And I haven't got a single bottle left here at the story. Uh, Mark is back or not back? He's muted. Oh. Okay. So yeah, that was me talking about Amarona casks. You found it, Mark? Oh yeah. <laughs> You're still muted. What did I miss? Ah, there you are. Uh, nothing, nothing important. I was just bragging about my Amarona cask. Oh. <laughs> did you did you did you try the Amarona cask? I love that. That is one of the. I've got it. I've got it right here. I think and this one also is one of the best things I ever made. This one also is uh, really well uh, disappearing very quickly. Now here's a couple. I want to show one more. Yeah. Yes, I want to show show one 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 other way in which I might be not not quite approaching your level of uh, of geekiness, but uh, but I'm getting there. Um, so. Uh, look what I have. I have a, a, a malt mill. Oh, yeah. So this is just for, you know, for home home brewing. Brewing, and home, yes. Yeah. Home experiments. Um, anyway, so so that's, uh, I actually haven't tried have it yet, but it? I have some barley. Oh. I haven't yet. I, I bought some barley locally that I will... Uh, um, mill myself and experiment with very soon, but uh, anyway, barley. so that's uh, yeah, yeah, malted barley. So that'll be my my fun this spring. And uh, earlier we were we were talking about the um, the settings on the the rollers. The roller yeah. So uh, don't mess with uh, if you visit Patrick's Distillery in <laughs> the Netherlands. 
Don't mess Don't with the, the settings. Mill. Don't touch the mill, he says. So pretty cool stuff. Um, and that that copper thing in the background also has has uh, seen uh, a little bit of use, but I, I can't talk about that because it's not uh, actually uh, legal in in Canada at all. Is it so, not? No, no, no. So it's I'll I'll say it's ornamental, and then I'll wink. It is very ornamental. Mm -hmm. It looks pretty too. Yeah, yeah. It does. Yeah. Um, anyway, so here's this bottle of uh, Millstone that uh, that I ended up just deciding that I really had to get because how can you like something this much and then not not go to the to the end of the road and pick up the the uh, last available interesting bottle of something? So this is the last bottle that was available in Canada, and I, I had to call the the shop and arrange for that one uh, to get here, and that is. Uh, oh, that one. Here we yeah. go. The Millstone yeah. Dutch Whiskey Single Barrel Oloroso Sherry 23-year-old. And That uh, was pretty decent as well. Quite dark. Whoops. Of course, color's not important, but that, that's almost as dark as night. The, the problem is color is something I cannot, you know, influence. You no. know, there's some of these... Whiskies are, they are what they are, and you cannot change it. Well, you could if you, you know, wanted to add some caramel or something, but this is all natural. You know, all our whiskies are natural and non chill filtered. And then sometimes you get things that are really dark, and sometimes you get things that are a little bit less dark. It's really hard to predict as well. So, I mean, like, I, I can't even see through that. There's a tiny little bit of light that comes through, but. Uh... Anyway, so pretty dark. So uh, we'll we'll get into the peated Is whiskeys and uh, sorry. Oh, Patrick, what did you say? <coughs> Is it cloudy or is it clear? The whiskey. Oh, it's clear. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it's one hundred percent clear. the The ambient temperature in here uh, in this room is about nineteen degrees so i think that's warm enough to keep it from from getting cloudy you can uh, see with, the, with the sherry cask, you're never quite sure you're never quite sure yeah with sherry cask things, things so I'm, i sometimes. might open this one up at the end uh all depending we'll see and uh and then i'll, I'll seal it up for christmas afterwards okay all right so Don't the peated. <laughs> yes i should not drop that one all right so we're going to start our peat peated whiskey journey here after the new make with uh with this one which is i guess that's probably would this be considered a core range from uh from millstone whiskey yes this is one of my biggest sellers as well it's it's really a, a whiskey that is universally uh liked by lots and lots of people and this one was distilled May of 13, 2013, and bottled uh, the 31st of April, 2018. So again, you bottled it a few days shy of being five years old for, uh, for some reason. Let's give that a whiff. Planning. <laughs> So again, so fruity, so elegant. The peat is uh, the peat is kind of like it's almost like you're in driving school, and the peat's not driving, but the peat still has control of the car, and uh, so the peat is still in control here, but it's letting the PX do some driving, which is kind of interesting. I don't know if that makes sense to you. The peat, the, the peat is quite subdued in the nose, isn't it? It's it's mm -hmm. in an I got lots of chocolate in the nose, and but but the peat is a little bit subdued in the background. Still, again, it's from the same 50 ppm malt, so it's the same new. Yeah, basically, it's the same as a new make that you just tasted, just from a, a different type of cask. It reminds me of um, the Swiss chocolate lint. Of course, Ooh, I, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't have too much access to to Dutch chocolate, but. Uh, lint chili chocolate. 
Beautiful. Love that. Uh, cheers again, Patrick. Really, really great having you here. Cheers. Cheers. As I just spilled some whiskey on my laptop. Lovely color as well for, for a young whiskey, isn't it? Really is. It really is. Mm. But this is probably my my best selling whiskey uh, at this moment. And you can see why it's very accessible, very, you know, easy to drink. You really said it. Um, and absence, absence of, of, um, uh, sulfur altogether. I mean, the peat, the peat, I think, yeah. uh, helps to, um, uh, to make that really, um, almost like sulfur free, but it's just there as a, uh, smokiness, which is interesting. You don't get a lot of sulfur in PX casks. You know, there's mm. more in more sulfur in Oloroso casks than in PX casks. If for some reason you don't get much sulfur in PX casks, uh, on occasion, every now and then you get the sulfured cask. But on the whole, you have less problems with PX casks than Oloroso casks. Wow. So it's just really so uh, so desserty. It's actually Pretty, got a real. It's so uh, I missed that, Patrick. You you broke up there for a second. Hopefully that's not my computer crashing now because of the whiskey that I spilled on it. No, the computer likes whiskey. Let's let's hope. <laughs> um, it's got a, a real desserty edge to it, um, both on the nose and on the palate. Again, the the peat is. Uh, the peat's there, uh, but it's again these these PX casks. Not to mention the the new make is uh, the like it's just really this uh, plum plum like um, subtly tart fruit from your new make combined with that uh, uh, that desserty effect of PX is really making this just wonderful. Hmm. And I should say, first of all, a huge, huge shout out to uh, to my brother and fellow whiskey tuber, uh, Pat, uh, pardon me, Rob over at Whiskey in the Six. Hey, Rob, how are you? Thank you so much for that super chat. Um, he just uh, decided he wanted to uh, to support the channel with a $14 uh, little bonus. So huge, huge, huge. Uh, very, uh, very, very nice of you. I thank you so much for that. And I, I've started to feel the effects of uh, of all the the wonderful Millstone whiskey that we've been having today. So uh, really, really fun. This is a great Friday for me. I think. Let me take another taste of this uh, peated PX. But you can see why it's selling so well. It is mm -hmm. just so accessible and, you know, easy to get along with. I think it's it, uh, you know, appeals to a wide range of people that that drink it. It's just I even serve it to people that don't like peated whiskey, because the peat is so, you know, unobtrusive. Then you know, even people that don't, oh, I don't like peated whiskey. They can drink this because not. So bold. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really um uh it's not as it's not as overtly like the the peat the peat is not the um it's not the the focus here. The focus is I think the focus the thing the thing that you were trying to do here is you're trying to take the the peated notes and the peated flavors and blend those in, uh, in a, a, a great synergy with those PX casks where each is having their moment, each is supporting the whiskey and lifting it up. And even the new make is able to, to shine a little bit here because I do see a bit of relationship between the new make and this uh, peated PX. 
I think the the thing is that what we try to do is is balance. We we think uh, the whole distillery is focused about trying to produce balanced whiskies. So it, it cannot be just cask forward. It cannot be just peat forward. It has to be a whole. It has to be a balance between the different flavor profiles. I think that is what makes a whiskey. Yes, I agree. That's what makes a whiskey really, really special. All right. Now, uh, I, f I forgot that I'm able to, to show um, uh, a little bit of people's comments. So I'll just show that one. Uh, big thanks oh. to, uh, to Rob for that. And uh, that's fantastic. But, um, and this is great. So I, I sent a package of all of these whiskeys to my friend Joseph Gulino in Chicago. And, uh, and he just got them. Where's his comment now? Oh, I can't find it. Anyway, so he's finally got his, uh, uh, his, his whiskeys. He's tasting along with us. And he's starting to share some comments about that as well. Uh, so just great to see. Um, Where's his, here we go. So his samples arrived, thank goodness. And he talks about the colors of some of the whiskeys. If I can find that one. But anyway, he saw that how dark that was. But really, really well done uh, with all of these, Patrick. And I think, uh, I think hopefully this, uh, th this good friend of mine in Chicago, I'm sure he'll be starting to look for Millstone uh, in Chicago, if it's available there. But uh, let's get on to the peated Amarone, which I think is uh, just uh -huh. a, a real killer. It's a killer whiskey. So that's the one we're going to try next. It is the Millstone peated Amarone cask distilled in 2016. So this is very young. And yet, uh, you you put it in your elegant decanter, which tells me that there was something special about this that you decided to put it in a fancy chalice. Yeah, when I was when you were gone, I was talking about how it came into being. Because this whiskey, you know, I don't like red wine casks. I usually think red wine cask gives you very unbalanced whiskey, and I I rarely had a a wine cask matured whiskey that I really liked. Um, but a friend of mine kind of forced me into buying these Amarone casks. Um, and um, so I just, and I bought 50 of them. And I think this is um, very, again, this turned out wonderful, you know, much better than I could ever hope for. It's a, a wonderful balanced whiskey with that wonderful notes in the background from the Amarona, but it's not pronounced. It's just all balanced and um, integrated into each other. And if you look at the color, it's it, it's got a teeny weeny little strange color. It's, it's a little bit reddish uh, in the brown. I don't know if you can see that, but it's it's not it's not red at all, but it's it's got this tint to it, like a hint of of color to it. Mm -hmm. like, a, um, like a little bit of pink. Yeah, a little bit of pink. I didn't want to say pink though. I said red. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you find that with some Amarone casks, and also it seems like some port casks give a, a little bit of a pink hue. Now, when I smell this, the first thing I think to myself is, "Oh, um, I can I can actually smell the the peated new make. Uh, the, the, there's a, a one to a one to one relationship here uh, with the nose. There's a distinct uh, link to your your peated new make. It's fruity. It's young, but it's 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 it turned into a really you know you shouldn't maybe not say that about my own whiskey, but I. I do think it turned into a really nice whiskey. It really did. Um, and now that I'm smelling this peated Amarone, when I go back to your peated new make, it reminds me of uh, of Mezcal. 
A little uh, bit, yeah. Yeah. Just a little bit of dirt on the side. Just a little beautiful, bit of that. Beautiful. Dirty hint of dirt. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's taste that one together. Cheers, everybody. I'm so glad you're watching Cheers. along with Patrick and I. Thank you for joining. Mm. The peat is more prominent in this Amarone versus the PX. Yes. Uh, it's a lot smokier. And yet uh, you still have this really elegant um, little bit of uh, pin cherry, a little bit of something like... Um, uh, like like underripe apricots as well, but again, it got this little bit of marzipan somewhere in there, yeah. Mm. And the marzipan and the peat, I think, work really well together on this. You know, the big difference between the the PX and this is not the barley itself, because the, it is distilled from the same barley. You know, fifty parts per million um, phenols in it, so it's a quite heavily peated barley but the difference is that this one at the cut point is at 64 and for the peter px i have the cut point at 68 hmm. so that 68 cut point gives you less of the smoky notes and more of the fruity notes and this cut point at 64 gives you a little bit more richness to the peat notes so it's, it's a slightly different um distillation regime on this one and so, you can and it, see that immediately in the in the final result mm -hmm. now what you're talking about is uh again for people that may not know as you're distilling uh the uh the the abv goes up and then it begins to drop and uh, you're talking about um 64 is your typical cut point so when it hits 64 percent you stop uh, you For stop. The yes. Uh, that that that's your heart, and then the rest of the rest of that will be recycled Afterwards. in the next. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, versus for this Amarone, you put the cut point at sixty eight, so a much a much uh, a much narrower heart. The other way around. The other way oh, around. Oh, other way around. Pardon so me. The, the P to PX is at sixty eight, mm. so it's a little bit cleaner, a little bit less smoky, mm. and then. As further along you get, the more heavy the smoke gets, the more richer the smoke gets. And, and that's why we cut it a little bit later for this whiskey. And it gives you a little bit wider um, uh, smoke, uh, uh, smoky flavor, more, a little bit wider peated flavor. Yes. Yeah. So this is yeah. actually very comparable with that new make that you tasted. Mm -hmm. the, the same distillation regime. Anyway, so uh, so Joe uh, Joseph Golino, Joe, he's tasting along now, and he tried the uh, the Oloroso Forty Six, and he goes uh, black licorice candy with butterscotch, and he thought it was very interesting. And Joe, you're he, behind. Yes, he's a little bit behind. His his package arrived a bit late, and uh, this is really funny. He's got he's got some great comments here. This is really interesting. Oloroso 1996 is like walking into a breakfast joint. Hazelnut French toast in your face. Beautiful. No, that's really enjoyable. And I think um, I think for the peat, peat heads out there, the people that focus on peat only, I think this uh, uh, the um, Amarone cask is unreal and it will sit in the uh um uh it will sit in the 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 pantheon of of great peated whiskies when people are talking about uh what whiskey was good a uh, 100 years from now when they're talking about about whiskey from 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 2020 they'll be talking about uh millstone i think well, i actually kept some part some some barrels of, aside so i mm. i I bottled half of them and the other half I keep for, you know, maybe when they're 10 years old or so. And we'll have a, we have another meeting and we'll do this again when they're 10 years old. Sounds great. We'll be a little bit grayer. And, uh, even uh, grayer. My yes. wife is already complaining. Uh, 
I think you're doing pretty well. Uh, uh, if you're if you're if you're 50, and I, I look at I look at you, and you look like you're you're younger than me, so well done. Uh, whiskey, it's the whiskey. It's the whiskey. All those days in the uh, the the whiskey infused air. Maybe that's uh, maybe yeah. yeah. I grew up in the distillery, of course. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're pick when pickling I was pickling your body. When I was a child, I, I was my, my father put me inside the still to clean it. That's that's amazing! Wow. No, that's because I was so small. So I fit it inside the still. <laughs> oh, perfect. Now, when I was first working in my family business, um, I was I was paid much less than minimum wage. How about you? You got paid. <laughs> I got paid. God, I have yeah. to tell my parents that. <laughs> yeah, they paid me three dollars an hour. Uh, the min minimum wage at that time was five, so uh, I could have I could have reported them. <laughs> I didn't get anything. <laughs> Amazing. Well, uh, that's pretty awesome. Um, okay, now we've had we've had the uh, the fill. Now I don't know what your time is like, but uh, uh, I tell you what. Let's let's let me look to the. Um, uh, the people that are chatting along, if you have some questions for Patrick, please pose them now and we'll talk about those. But also, uh, I'd like to hear from you. Please let me know if you think that this is a great time to to pop the cork on this uh, as yet unopened Oloroso Sherry 23-year-old. I don't see how you managed to wait this long. I'm I'm a pack rat. I can do that. When I, when I think about Whiskey, I'm like, oh yeah, this will be great for Christmas, and so I immediately you can put it drink on my some shelf. now, and it will still be great for Christmas. That's true. You got a point. You got a point. All right. So, what do you think? Uh, get your questions posed uh, in the chat, and we'll talk about those. And also, let me know if you'd like to see that uh, that opened here uh, on the uh, the live stream together with Patrick. I actually got some of that here. Oh, that's great. I'm going to open it. I don't know what you're doing, but I'm going to open it. Okay, so we got a lot of comments about pop the cork and do it. Do it. Do it. Look at that color. Look at and, that color. Oh, How can you resist that color? You're right. I can't. I can't. And we have... Uh, Great comments here. Wine Light Media says, do it, buddy. Okay, well, I guess I'll have to do that then. So here we go. For the first time, right on camera, we'll try that together. It's even better than the other one. Oh, man. I got to use my teeth. Sorry about that. Come on. Must have whiskey. Uh, good okay, packaging, I got, eh? I got it. I got it. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. Now, um, sometimes I like to, to just kind of like it. shake it a little <laughs> bit just to make sure that everything's all homogenous. <laughs> There we go. Okay, everybody ready? And let's count down. Three, two, one. Beautiful. Okay. And it has to go into a nice clean glass. And we'll pour that. Maybe a little bit more, look, hey? Look at that color. Yeah, really, really dark. And this one also has a, 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 a interesting, almost, I don't know, like a ruddy red hue to it. Yeah, you get that from some of these Oloroso casks. If okay. you compare that to, to the other one, to the 1996, you'll see that this one is even even richer in, in the nose. So just comparing color with the uh, 1996. 
It's even darker. Yeah, it's quite quite a bit darker. But if you compare the nose, it's, it's really different. And this is what I meant before. It's not the age difference between these casks. It's, it's, it's just that some cask turned out different than other casks. And, and there's nothing you can do about it as a distillery. It's, it's with these old sherry casks that, you know, there's one cask and another cask. And they don't, you know, they come out differently. And not necessarily one is better than the other. It's just that they turn out differently. It's like your kids, you know. One is different from the other, and you still love them all the same. Absolutely. Now, the first thing that I'm noticing here when I'm smelling this 23-year-old uh, is that um, there's, a, there's a similarity with whatever cask this was pardon me, to some of the casks that, that Kabbalan uses for their Oloroso, uh, their Oloroso Sherry Solist. So I mm. don't know. Uh, uh, we fish in the same pond. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's the thing, right? So would this also be uh, one of the Solera casks and not yes, uh, Sherry yes. seasoned? Yeah. No, no, this is all Solera. But, you know, for me, What's surprising me, if I know this, that it's very fresh. You know, it's a 23-year-old it really whiskey, is. but it's very fresh. That's a great descriptor. Um, uh, even though there's some dark, uh, very, very dark fruit in there, there's also a little bit of um, uh, maybe a, a sprig of mint or something in there that just kind of uh, elevates that to, to the... Um, to the the nose slightly and again yes but, very fresh but not so much marzipan as in the other one no no not at all and joe getting through the p to px he's he's almost catching up uh patrick pretty impressive he is catching up yeah if he likes the p to px I'm, I'm actually wondering what he'll like how what he'll think about uh a marona cask i'm curious as well Shall we wait for him? And to to craft sellers who had to uh, to go, thanks for watching. Great having you along. And uh, we're still holding it about uh, twenty people watching concurrently. And I think probably by the end of the day, we'll have maybe a couple hundred people. And I think I think this video will live on in the uh, uh, in the future and hopefully become just oh a God, beacon. That's quite scary. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be a, a, a beacon for people to check out and say, okay, what are some whiskeys that I should try that are not from uh, from uh, Scotland and Ireland, USA, Japan, and Ireland? And pardon me, I repeated myself, and Canada. And I, I guess we still forgot about the the, the peat bogs. Now, uh, you, Freddie had asked about um, uh, peat bogs in, in the Netherlands. And we already yes. talked about uh, about the uh, the whiskey, the, the the barley for the malt for the the peated coming from uh, from Scotland. Mm, but yes. have you ever tried to use any peat that's uh, that's sort of more local? Actually, I, I was in contact with the Dutch forestry department because um, they have tons of peat available here in Holland. Because um, you know, it's it's one of those things we have plenty of. It's just that I cannot find a local maltings that want to make me a peated malt because they are afraid that they're going to get into trouble when they go back to the unpeated malt uh, mm. production. So that the, the problem is not the peat and the problem is not the barley. The problem is finding a maltings that wants to do peated barley from my barley and my peat. And I, I guess when you, when you want to do um, one, one distillation, um, how many how many tons of barley do you need? Um, usually, per day, it is about uh, three tons. Three tons, and per day, uh, obviously that that means one one double distillation process uh, per day. Yes. Yeah, three tons. And uh, you said seventeen thousand liters is the size of your wash still. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. um, so what uh, uh, if if you if you uh, if you were producing 
as much as you possibly could, um, how many liters a year could you produce? Who? Okay, I don't know. Um, the thing is, we only do one shift because yeah. we do very the thing, and we do very slow distillation. So, we, yeah. so one distillation round it takes about nine hours. Nine hours. So, um, yeah. And what? And the output of that is. Uh, it, it is about uh, a thousand liters, two thousand liters, sixteen hundred liters. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Sixteen, eighteen hundred liters. Yeah. So yeah, something like that. So, so three, uh, three tons, three tons is about twelve hundred liters, hundred percent. Okay. So, so working on a on one shift a day, and is that is that seven days a week? So 1,200 liters is about 10 casks, just to put it. Okay. So I guess... Um, uh, That's just for this pair of stills. Right. We have another pair of stills. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well, there we go. So we're talking about a million liters a year. Uh, and the potential, if you were to add a shift, if you could add, add a shift if you wanted to. Or two, uh, yeah. So then you could end up with about 2 million liters a year, which is... Uh, that's enormous. Yes. So is, we, we're a decent sized distillery. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not, you know, backyard thing. This is, um, a decent size operation. And, uh, Yorka uh, is asking me if I've tried any of your, your, uh, Genevers and I've tried and I really love them. And I have one here that we'll maybe try if you have time. I, I, I get, I think we're, we're getting a bit long uh, in our our event here today, uh, but uh, let, let's get, give this one a try. The twenty three year old uh, that I popped just just for you and if for everybody watching. That's the one that we opened just now. Uh, cheers, Patrick. Really appreciate your time. Yes. Um, I think everybody is so happy that you could uh, hang out with me today and and hang out with everybody that's watching along. Do you get cherries on this as well? On the nose, yes. Mm hmm In the mouth as well, actually. Yes, very cherry. Like cherry syrup. Um, or like and the, the it, uh what's that fancy brand of, of maraschino cherries for cocktails? Oh yes, those are nice actually. Mm hmm So there's a little bit of you know marzipan in the in the aftertaste though. A little bit in the background. Some bitter almonds in the background there. It's very oily. Really, really mouth coating. And that freshness we talked about, that's kind of like a little bit of mint added, is carrying through the palate also into the finish, which is nice. Yeah, there's some mintiness to it, yeah. It's like a menthol quality. Mm hmm See how different it is from the from the nineteen ninety six. Yes, yeah, it's um, it's from I mean, the, it's not it could be from the same production. Eh? It could mm -hmm. be from the same production. Um, yes, yep, yeah, same same distillate. Yeah, so you see how how the cask influences that. The final result is so dependent on uh, on the cask that you put it in. This one is more. Uh, caramel and uh, dark toffee, um, and none of that sort of fresh mintiness. And then we have this really, just really interesting, um, almost like just like a mint sprig garnish on on a nice um, uh, a nice old fashioned. Hmm. That was really smart of um, Greg and Yarka to get uh, the same distillates so that, so that people who are uh, crazy about whiskey like me can say, oh, wait a minute, that's the same distillate from the same day? I've got to get it. So well done for them. <laughs> but also, it's, it's, uh, I think for people like you it's, and, and, and everybody, I think it's interesting to see how different those two whiskeys are, even if they are produced on the same day, even if even if they are um, um, 
age the same type of cask, they just end up being really, really uh, different whiskeys. It's it's an, an incredible how different they are, and I hopefully I didn't put up uh, some expletives and some uh, some uh, nasty language from from uh, uh, Gear Ackers. Uh, so I'm not sure what that says. Hopefully it's not uh, an insult. No, he says, um, you're welcome and um, hello back. So oh, that's hi, great. Geert. <laughs> How are you doing? Wonderful. Okay, so uh, is it okay? Can I try the, the uh, uh, Geneva with you? Of course. Okay. I don't have one here with me, though, but uh, which one did so you get? I have, uh, I've got a whole pile of them. Ooh. But uh, And last night I tried the... Uh, uh, I think it's um, R O G G E. That means rye, oh, right? It's rye, Geneva. Rye. Yeah. 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 See, it's interesting because uh, uh, the Dutch language and the Danish language have a lot of similarities, um, and so rye in Danish is uh, uh I'm not sure about how it sounds in 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 Dutch. Roche. Roche. So it's ru. Ru in Danish and Roha, Roha. I can't say that in in your language. So, so that's the one I have here. Oh, that one is nice as well. Yeah. So this is a. Uh, uh, and how do you say? Is it Geneva or Geneva? Yeah. No, I think I I always call it Geneva. Geneva. So thirty year old old Geneva. Uh, yeah, that's sharing. actually the oldest. That's actually quite new. That's the oldest I've ever bottled. 30 years old, if, if people didn't see that. So 30 years old, single barrel, uh, 38%. Yeah, that's awful. I wouldn't try that if I were you. What? You'll what? Never, you'll never go back to whiskey after that. <laughs> okay. We'll just try a little taste. I want to save some. And the grain for this one, what, what's the difference here with uh, the Geneva? versus uh versus whiskey well the the whiskeys that we tasted so far were all malt whiskeys so they yeah. were made from malted barley and the geneva mash bill is a secret mash bill made up of a third corn a third rye and a third malted barley oh so it's not so secret anymore yeah don't tell anybody <laughs> a third corn a third malted rye. barley and a third rye rye so okay Um, almost a almost a bourbony mash bill, yeah. So it's a uh, yes, you know, different, different proportions, but it's almost a bourbony mash bill. It's it's really interesting because you have all these unique grainy uh, notes in there. Taste it, and the rye is. Uh, the, I, I want to say that amongst the grain, the rye is the one that's really showing um, in mm. the nose. Yeah, I'm a bit of a rye freak, so that makes sense. All right, um, Patrick, cheers again to you. Cheers. I don't have that here, actually. Beautiful. Mm. That's actually the oldest cask in my warehouse, that. It really stands up. It's it's as as delicious as this uh, twenty three year old single malt. It's a it's a different beast, but it's it's very complex as well. Is there also some kind of botanical that's involved in the production of of this yeah. uh, Geneva? I think that's the big difference between Geneva and and whiskey is that we distill it with some botanicals as well. In this case, uh, mainly juniper, which is where the, the name comes from. Mm. So, um. Juniper and a little bit of licorice is in there. Hmm. Some licorice root. Yes. That's really interesting. And look at uh, look at Joe uh, Joseph Colino, my friend Joe, having a um, really amazing millstone experience at home with the uh, the samples that I sent uh, to him. So he is. Uh, did he try the Amarone yet? Uh, did he try the Amarone? I don't know. Joe, did you try the Amarone? 
Let's see what he says. But um, uh, this is actually sweeter in a sense. Mm. And uh, uh, 30, it's 38 percent, I think, is what it said it was. Yeah, yeah, 38 is a very and and yet it's uh, it's really uh, uh, lip smackingly luscious and mouth coating and it's not lacking whatsoever. No, but um, you have to keep in mind this is aged at forty five, so it's the fatting strength is forty five for this. Is that a law for Geneva? No, no, no. That's well, oh, okay. But that kind of influences the mouth feel. Mm. So it got that kind of you know velvety, creamy mouthfeel mm -hmm. to the Geneva's. Um, and part of that, you know, comes from that, um, what do you call that? That that very low filling strength, the very low ABV where we age it at. Okay, so, so we have a comment, a uh, comment above here. And uh, bye to Christian Strecker who had to run. And let me find, uh, let's see. Uh, so car carry on about uh, Geneva. So, um, the fill, fill, uh, uh, barrel fill strength is 45%. And uh, you've got juniper and some licorice involved uh, as botanicals. 33% mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, corn, 33% malted barley, 33% 30, rye. Yes. Is there any, anything else I'm missing there? Yeah, the difference is that it's fermented on the grain. Because mm. of with all these unmalted, like like a bourbon, yeah. So with all these unmalted grains in the mash bill, you cannot lotter it. So you cannot drain the. Um, <laughs> he likes it. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot drain uh, the the warts of it. Um, so you're stuck with a, a mash that looks like, you know, a porridge, basically, and then you're fermenting a porridge. So it's quite challenging to ferment that and to distill that. Mm. And have it, you know, not burn uh, to the to the heating elements in your still. So um, it takes, you know, experience and and a lot of, uh, you know, messing up um, to to learn how to do it right. But then, you know, it's very rewarding once you do it. You know, you know how to do it. is is a very rewarding drink to make. Now, I would guess that uh, Geneva. Um, consumption in um, in the Netherlands uh, probably was very high um, until about the 1980s, and then dropped a lot. True. And and has has it begun to rebound? I think the, um, you have to in in Geneva you have to separate you know the mass produced colorless clear things that your grandfather drank. Uh, from what we're doing here. So, because we're making Geneva's that appeal to people that drink whiskey or cognac or mm. rum. Eh? So it's a, a flavor profile that is very comparable to to whiskey uh, in some in some ways. I think um, as a whiskey drinker, you probably like this kind of, of drinks as well. Mm. Even though they're not whiskey, they're Geneva, but, but they hit a lot of the same things. Hi, Joseph. Thank you. Uh, Joe, thanks a lot for, for joining along today and for everybody that's followed along. Uh, so first of all, as a summary here, uh, there, there is not a single whiskey here that I wouldn't want to, uh, to, to let my, uh, uh, my best whiskey friends try. Um, I, I probably, I think for me, I want to... I'm gonna I'm gonna keep some of that for my whiskey archives, uh, Patrick. One of the geeky, geeky things that I do is I keep about two or four ounces of every whiskey that I've ever tried in an archives uh, that goes back now about uh, about about six years uh, back to um, well when I started really loving whiskey. I've been enjoying whiskey since uh, 1995 or so, but I didn't really start. Uh, getting crazy about it until about uh, 2000 and 2009 or so. But anyway, so I've got this archives, and one day my my daughters can uh, uh, can try all of those and maybe relive one day. some of the experiences. So that's going to be in my archives for sure. Mm. 
But anyway, all of these are just incredible. And uh, I think the highlights, every one of them is just so amazing, whether it's a young millstone or an old, uh, they, they, they hit different, um, uh, different parts of my palate and different parts of my whiskey desires. The young whiskeys seem to, to hit uh, uh, that kind of fruity or um, slightly more boisterous flavor that I want in a whiskey. And then the older ones, obviously, they're, they're very elegant and very special and uh, whiskeys that make you sit down and you stop thinking about everything. Every other thought in your mind goes away, whether that's about coronavirus or or uh, you know your your monthly bills or whatever. It's all gone, and all, it's just me and this whiskey just sitting there, and impressive, just so impressive, uh, Patrick. Thank you so much. And Geneva, I think, is a category that I'm going to be exploring um, because I think that uh, that it's it's unique and it's it is something new, something different, something that people can, can look into to uh, uh, just make a bit of a shift and take a break from whiskey for expand, whiskey nuts. Yeah. Expand your experience. Mm -hmm. So really beautiful stuff. And just before we finish this out, um, one thing I wanted to ask, which we didn't get to yet was when you're not drinking Millstone at home uh, after work, what what kind of whiskeys are you enjoying for yourself, Patrick? I, I do love a wide variety of different products. I know I like Japanese whiskey. You know, uh, Hibiki Twenty One is one of my all time favorite whiskeys. You know, it's such a wonderful whiskey. Um, and then you know, Old Macallans. You know, uh, I love Old Macallans. Um, the Ton Fourteen O One uh, things from Balvenie. Those are really awesome. Um, yeah, so you know, wide variety of things uh, that that are truly wonderful to drink. Um, I think Cavalan is awesome. They make some awesome stuff over there. Um, had a chat with Ian just the other day, and uh, yeah, he's all uh, awesome stuff they make over there as well. So it's a it's a you know, um, have you tried the, the, some of the Cotswolds whiskies? Those are really nice as well. One of them, and actually, uh, when I mentioned the, the mini series where I had a bunch of different mini bottles, Cotswolds was one of those, and it was very good, but uh, it didn't hold a candle to the uh, uh, the Millstone Oloroso Sherry, that one. Uh, but I'll, I'll have to revisit. There's just so many. It's it's almost like an an, um, an infinite number of of possibilities now in the world where you can you can try whiskeys from Germany, from, uh, from Tasmania, from, um, of course, the Netherlands, from Denmark, from Sweden, Norway. Um, uh, there's even a whiskey from, from Turkey that I want to try that I think is, is no longer produced, but it's called Ankara. And maybe I'll try one day, but, um, box, box is really nice as well from Sweden. Box, yes. I think they had to rename the the distillery oh, to High, High Coast. Coast. Yeah, the, oh, sorry, sorry. High I, Coast. So I've I just, known them for so long. I, I still call them Box. Mm, Don't tell them. I liked I like the name Box High Coast. It'll take an adjustment, but uh, I think it's also a pretty strong name. Uh, I bought two of those. We'll see how those are. Um, and Freddie is talking about Israel. Yes, the uh, milk and honey uh, coming out of uh, of Israel, which. Uh, uh, I have a, a few a few bottles of so I don't, I don't know if you've tried the milk and honey but it's also no excellent. Taz still has to send me one hopefully he will um, so anyway I think it's it's uh, we'll have to wind this down but a uh, huge thank you to you Patrick um, this is uh, a fantastic thing for me personally and I apologize I'm not quite I'm not quite fully capable of doing this and yet I've, I've done it uh, for you. These live streams is kind of a new thing for me. And uh, so a little bit rough, a little bit uh, unpolished, but we had a good time and I appreciate it's it. Probably my fault. Every time you interview me, we'll go off on a different direction. And <laughs> we'll get there in the end. We will. We will. So Thanks I hope for everybody me. had a great time. Cheers to everybody watching along and a big cheers to you, Patrick. And uh, 
Uh, thank you so much. This 23 year old is in incredible. And I've got to go pick up my kids. So I'm going to put a lid on that and keep that for my afternoon dram. Cheers, Mark. Thanks okay. for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. We'll talk soon. Really appreciate bye bye. it. And uh, take care, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye, -bye. bye now.